Mm. Well. well, good afternoon. Well, thank you for being here, and more importantly, I want to thank you for what you do on a daily basis. Does this sound a bit odd? <laughs> I want to thank you for what you do for our students, for each other, for the manner in which you represent Texas Tech University, and for the many ways that you advance the quality and the impact of this institution. In preparing for my remarks today, I spent some time reviewing the first State of the University address I gave three years ago. And standing before you today, and reflecting on how this institution has changed and grown since then, I think we can be proud of what we've achieved together. Since the fall of 2016, Texas Tech has attained a number of records and distinctions that have elevated the reputation of our school while showing progress in each of the areas of our three strategic priorities. For instance, we've attained records in enrollment, retention, degrees awarded, and research expenditures. We met the enrollment benchmark to be designated a Hispanic-serving institution in the fall of 2017, and in this past year, Texas Tech achieved official, official designation from the U.S. Department of Education as a Hispanic-serving institution, and we're now eligible to apply for funding that will support edu educational programs that benefit all students. I would emphasize that our designation as a Hispanic-serving institution is reflective of a broader commitment to inclusivity and diversity. Since the last university address, we were reaffirmed as a Carnegie R1 highest research activity institution. This speaks to our growing research enterprise and doctoral programs. Texas Tech has also been the recipient of two significant national awards during this past year. The W.K. Kellogg Foundation Community Engagement Scholarship Award from the Association of Public and Land-Grant Universities and the Senator Paul Simon Award for Comprehensive Internationalization awarded by NAFSA. This past year was especially notable because of the recent legislative session. The 86th legislative session has been characterized by Chancellor Ted Mitchell as the most consequential for Texas Tech in 50 years. It provided the support and funding that has allowed us to move forward with the establishment of the Texas Tech School of Veterinary Medicine. Groundbreaking for that facility occurred this past fall, and we are now progressing with the degree program approval process with the Texas Higher Education Coordinating Board. And we look forward to enrolling the first class in the fall of 2021. I want to acknowledge our legislators in Austin for their support of education that included a commitment of an additional $1 billion for higher education in this state. I'm especially grateful to our West Texas delegation and our local members, Senator Charles Perry, and Representatives Frulo and Burroughs. For athletics, this past year was one of the most memorable in the history of this institution, winning a national championship in track and field, and reaching the national championship in basketball, and returning to the College World Series again. I will share more detail related to some of these records and distinction I have mentioned but it's, that is not the primary focus or the spirit of what I want to convey today. Texas Tech is an extraordinary place, and that is because of you. Students, faculty, staff, and a culture of respect, friendliness, and pride. One of the blessings of serving as president is the special perspective it provides to see the great breadth of contributions that make Texas Tech so special. In preparing for this state of university address, I wanted to provide a more personal story of who we are and what we do in our efforts to accomplish the goals that we laid out in our strategic plan. And I'll remind you of those three strategic priorities. 
educate and empower a diverse student body, enable innovative research and creative activity, and transforms lives and community through engagement and engaged scholarship. At the onset, let me acknowledge that I won't come close to fully capturing the many who are part of this story. Nevertheless, over the past few weeks, I've been visiting classes and offices around campus to experience what's happening in classrooms and to learn more of the good work that go goes on in so many offices. Today I will share with you some of the impressions and the personal stories, stories of students, staff, and faculty, what they have accomplished and how they contribute to the narrative of Texas Tech. Within the context of these stories, there are some basic points I want to make. We are progressing on being one of the country's best institutions of higher learning, making sure that we have an impact through our teaching, research, creative activity, outreach, and engagement. And beyond strategic priorities, goals, and benchmarks, across this campus, there is a pervasive commitment to certain core values that distinguish Texas Tech as a place where students, faculty, and staff find opportunities where they can excel personally and at the same time enhance the success of others and make a difference in our university, our state, and the world. Let me begin by expressing that our university is strong with an upward trajectory that is increasingly recognized around the country and the world. As we grow and enjoy historical successes, I'm proud that we retain certain core values that have distinguished the educational experience of our students and keep our alumni connected to the university. I need to emphasize the importance of that support of our alumni and friends. Because of the experiences of our students and the alumni when they were here, and the pride they take in our accomplishments, we benefit from exceptional philanthropic support. During the past three years, Texas Tech has received over $315 million in donations that provide for support of professorships, facilities, operations, and especially scholarships. Texas Tech is committed to providing access and opportunity. And I've said on other occasions, we want to be elite without being exclusive. Scholarships and financial support, when coupled with the educational experiences made possible by faculty and staff, contribute to a student-centric culture that is one of our hallmarks and core values. <clears throat> it was five years ago that we launched the Student Success Collaborative and instituted a number of practices with the intent to improve graduation rates and retention. Much progress has been made. This past fall, we achieved a record retention rate of 87%, 6% higher than when the Student Success Initiative was launched. This is in spite of the fact that our freshman class last year was 1,700 larger than when we began this effort. The increase in retention is reflected in improving graduation rates. This past year, we had a record for our four-year and five-year graduation rates, and our six-year graduation rate increased to 61%, the third highest ever at Texas Tech. But clearly, we have much to do to achieve our institutional goal of a 70% six-year graduation rate. The number of degrees awarded is another important metric related to the success of our students. This past year, Texas Tech awarded a record number of degrees, 8,480. It's significant that we are growing the number of degrees awarded at a much greater weight than we're increasing enrollment. Our enrollment has increased by nearly 12% over the past five years. But over this period, we've increased the number of degrees awarded by 
To further emphasize the impact of our student success, I have several student stories I'd like to share. <clears throat> First, I'd like to introduce Samuanita Valenciano. Is, is she here? Is, oh, there she is. <clears throat> San Juanita will be graduating in December at the age of 67. I hope you don't mind me sharing that. <laughs> With a degree in Spanish. <clears throat> she began her college education nearly 50 years ago in 1971 at Lubbock Christian University. After one semester, she left to start a family with her husband, Jose. Jose, are you here? <laughs> when her husband, Jose, went back to, for his master's in 2012, it motivated her to return to tech. Jose shared this comment. From day one, she always said, I'm going to finish. I'm going to teach my children and my grandchildren to finish what you start. And she has made an impression on them. She has two daughters and a son that have graduated from Texas Tech. <clears throat> Tristan Russo is not here, but I think he has a very compelling story. Tristan Russo worked for eight years as a mechanic in South Florida before he began pursuing a college degree at a community college. His search for what he wanted in life took him to Texas Tech University, where he sought a degree in petroleum engineering. He received a full ride as a Terry Scholar and became a Red Raider in the fall of 2015. He graduated with a bachelor's degree in petroleum engineering and was hired on Sub-C-7 as a graduate engineer. After a year of working on Sub-C-7, he started a career as an offshore operations engineer with Talos Energy uh, in the Gulf Coast. So his career has taken him from the Arctic to the Gulf Coast, and he shared the following comment of his experience at Texas Tech. <clears throat> when I started attending Texas Tech, I had no idea how far my education there would take me. I'm amazed every day at what can be accomplished with hard work and the right support. Um, next, I want to feature uh, student regent Sean Lewis. Sean may be, uh, he's in a law, is he, Sean, are you here? Uh, he's in class, he's in law school right now, but he, he may show up later. So Sean's first time in Lubbock and on the Tech campus was when he helped his older sister move in in her freshman year. Even then, he could feel the sense of community and belonging so strongly that he wanted to be part of it, even though he was far from his home in Virginia Beach. From his first days on campus, he became very involved and went on to serve as the president of the Student Government Association. He's now a law student and also a student regent on our Board of Regents. You couldn't find a best, better ambassador for tech than Sean Lewis. Next, I'd like to mention Patrick, Patrick Albritton. Um, I have the pleasure of traveling around the country meeting with alumni chapters. And this summer, I went to a number of chapters in Colorado. And while in Colorado Springs, I met Colonel Patrick Albritton with the US Air Force. He's department head of the Department of Civil and Environmental Engineering in the Air Force Academy where he teaches. Patrick shared that when he was a senior in high school in 1991, he was accepted to every engineering program, public engineering program in the state of Texas. And you know that includes some very good schools. But he um, wanted to be involved in ROTC and he said that as he visited other campuses, he didn't feel a strong connection to the people or a sense of community. So later in the process, his mother was headed to Lubbock for a business trip, and Patrick decided to join her and visit Tech. When he arrived on campus, he met Dr. Warren Way, Way, Ray, who was the chair of civil engineering and also happened to be a reserve lieutenant colonel at, uh, at Reese Air Force Base. And Patrick shared with me 
that Dr. Ray took the time to take him on a personal tour of campus and also give him free lunch. <laughs> and so not only did Patrick decide to attend Texas Tech where he majored in civil engineering, but he forged a lifelong relationship with Dr. Ray. In fact, in 1996, Dr. Ray handed Patrick his diploma in the morning and then commissioned him as an officer in the U.S. Air Force later that afternoon. It was about the human interaction, the personal touch, the relationships. That brought Patrick to Texas Tech, and I'm also hopeful that that will help us recruit his son, Connor, to Lubbock, who's a senior in high school at the moment. And speaking of human interaction and the personal touch, this was the overwhelming impression I took from the classes that I visited in the last few weeks. It was a great experience, and I would really recommend that you just pop in to a colleague's class. You get a real sense that we are a community of learners and educators, and I came away so proud of what I saw. The first class I visited was Dr. Ali Smith. She has a PhD in immunology and molecular microbiology, microbiology and teaches honors college courses. And prior to coming to Tech, she worked at a research and testing laboratory here in Lubbock. But it was apparent in her class of 23 students, I think she said two were missing that day, that beyond the specific topic of the course, which dealt with bioinformatics, she was able to convey a sense of application into the lecture and references to career paths that seemed so meaningful to the students because of her experience outside the academy. A few days later, I went to Dr. Richard Verone's class, room 104 in Holden Hall. Um, I would estimate there were 150 to 200 students in that class. But the sense of interaction was just as intense. In fact, the students seemed mesmerized by him. They were on the edge of their seats, constantly interacting, responding to his questions. And when I walked out of there with Grace Hernandez, I told her, um, I really believe that some of these students will take that experience with them for the rest of their lives. He was discussing the early stages of the Revolutionary War, the shot heard around the world and then ended with the Declaration of Independence. And it was done in such a moving and compelling way. I also went to see the class of Dr. Joe Hote, professor of honors, and he, who deals in, whose study is in the area of Middle Eastern studies. That day, he was discussing the 9-11 tragedy. Uh, Dr. Hote's scholarship deals with Middle East history, and he was raised in New York City, so he brought a particularly special insight into that experience. I also just recently went to Harvinder Gill's course in heat transfer. Um, Dr. Gill is probably better known as an accomplished researcher, and in fact, recently him and Steve Presley I saw uh, in um, environmental toxicology just got a $3.5 million award for the National Institute of Health to develop a universal flu vaccine. But Dr. Gill is equally impressive in the classroom. Uh, he embodies a trait that is common among faculty who excel as educators and scholars, and it's characteristic of every faculty member I saw. What makes him so effective is their obvious mastery and passion for material, but a genuine concern to the students and the ability to engage them in a way that brings life to the subject. I also toured offices that provide critical resources and are essential to our student retention and success. We are blessed to have a staff that are professional, dedicated, and very friendly. And in fact, I made a comment, Grace went with me on all these trips, and. I told her, I said, you know, it's so different when you go into an office with staff, they go, welcome, we're glad you're here. When you go into a faculty member's room, they go, what do you want? <laughs> it's different. Um, Bobby Brown is a registrar, registrar here and has been employed at Texas Tech for more than 22 years. She and her staff of 23 process on average 68,000 transcripts a year. More importantly, they constantly interact with the provost's office regarding all academic matters 
and provide services that enhance the student's experience from their first enrollment to graduation. Christy Blakeney is the Managing Director of Student Business Services and has worked at Texas Tech since 2003 and as the bursar since 2009. Student Business Services is a student-focused department of 24 that concentrates on providing accurate and timely billing. But what you will gain from visiting with her and that office is the way they try to facilitate the process for these students who find somewhat daunting to deal with the bill and their families. And there's a lot of collaboration between her office and the financial uh, aid office just down the hall. And while we were there, Raider Red was caught with his hand in the till. <laughs> I don't know how he types with those big gloves. <laughs> um, Dr. Shannon Venezia is the Managing Director of Financial Aid and Scholarships. She recently joined Texas Tech University coming from the University of Connecticut and is responsible for financial aid disbursements of over $300 million and oversees a staff of full, 40 full-time staff. Last fiscal year, Texas Tech awarded over $155 million in scholarship, approximately 70% of our, of, each, of our student body receive some financial aid. Now over the past three years, we have increased scholarship for both merit and need by about $15 million. And as a result of this support, this past fall in our new freshman class, there were over 3,300 presidential scholars. In 2016, we had slightly more than 1,100. We now have 67 national merit finalists on campus and in 2016, we had 16. We also provide more than $10 million in support for transfer students, one of the largest amounts of any institution in this state, and this will continue to be a priority for us. We also know that our first generation and Pell recipients do not gra graduate at the same rate as our institutional average. Going forward, Dr. Venencia, in collaboration with Dr. Patrick Hughes in the Office of Student Success and Retention, and Vice President Carol Sumner and her team in the Office of Diver Diversity, Equity, and Conclusion, will increasingly focus attention, attention on the recruitment and support of these students. One important source of support is the Texas Tech Career Center. There I visited with Director Jay Kilo, where he and his team provide resources to students from their initial enrollment, where they do a skills assessment during uh, the recruitment phase, up through graduation, when they help them prepare their resumes and prepare for interviews. Um, there is a photo here, I believe, of some clothing. And uh, I did not know this, but they have a closet full of clothes that students make use of when they go on interviews. And today, during office hours, uh, when I was meeting with students, they mentioned that they had taken advantage of that. So, if you have some clothes you want to get rid of, you can take them over to the Career Center where they'll find very good use. Uh, Julie McCauley is Managing Director at the Student Wellness Center and has been with Texas Tech for 17 years. The center serves as the primary case primary care clinic for Texas Tech students. Julie and her team provide a tremendously important service. In fiscal year 19, the Wellness Center had 24,500 visits with over 12,000 students. In addition to providing care for urgent medical needs, chronic illness, and preventative care, they increasingly treat students with mental health concerns. In this regard, they work closely with the Texas Tech Physicians Department of Psychiatry to assist these students. Today, during office hours, a young man came to my office um, to let me know, and I was aware of this, that a student had committed suicide this week. We have a crisis in this country among this generation. Um, about a week ago, Kirby Hokut and I went to Lorenzo to visit with an implement dealer about some issues. There were a couple of points we want to discuss. How can we better educate our students 
about the importance of agriculture, but they also asked, how can Texas Tech help us in providing mental health care for the issues that are confronting those in rural America? And so this is, I assured that student that this is a high priority for our university. You might be aware that a couple years ago we started the Institute for Mental Health, um, and that's something uh, that, that it's a first step, but there's much more to do, and it's something we will, pay, we will continue to deal with very seriously. Um, I also had the occasion to go to the cooling plant. Uh, we can't forget the incredible work of our staff across the campus in, ver in the various departments and operations. Um, their efforts ensure that we really have a world-class campus. Um, the university's central cooling, heating and cooling plant provides steam and chilled water for more than 10 million square feet of the main campus. It's a tremendously complicated operation. So there I met with Susan Kitten, the managing director, Dan Moore, the associate director of operations, and Wayne Lucas, the assistant director of maintenance. Now, if you look carefully at that photograph, you'll see there's not a speck of dust on those boilers. I mean, that, that place is cleaner than my office. <laughs> and I asked Wayne, uh, how do you keep this so clean? He said, well, somebody's in charge, but mostly it's just pride. And that was the sentiment I picked up across this campus. People take tremendous pride in what they do, and I thank you for that. I'd, I'd not like to turn now and make a few comments about our contributions in research and scholarship. Our research enterprise is growing, and I believe the impact is increasing. This slide here is something you may have seen in the letter that came out from Joe Heppert, Vice President for Research, Provost Galley, and myself uh, earlier last week. We, in the last three years, we have set records for our total research expenditures and our restricted research expenditures, and this year we also set a record for federal awards that hopefully will translate into higher federal research expenditures in the future, something we need to do. You'll also notice in the slide that we have uh, our rankings in the National Science Foundation Higher Education and Research Development Survey. So we are in the top 10% in terms of the number of graduate students. We're in the top 15% in terms of degrees awarded. We're in the top 15% in terms of total research expenditures in the top 20 in federal. These are impressive numbers that speak to why we are a Carnegie One school. But again, these sort of statistics don't capture the breadth and the type of scholarship and creative activity that goes on here. And so I want to uh, feature a few faculty. Elisa Wong and John Carroll in the Honors College recently won an award from the National Endowment for the Humanities, called Humanities Driven STEM, a new paradigm for the liberal arts that introduces students to the ideas that humanities are the impetus for human innovation. An outcome of this research is to help students appreciate the interrelatedness of disciplines and the complexity of the problems that we face. And for those of you who may read the Chronicle, in the latest issue this past week, there was an article that appeared entitled, um, Can You Get Students Interested in the Humanities Again? with the subtitle, These Colleges May Have Figured It Out, and it highlighted a few schools. Well, I'd say that Dr. Wong and Dr. Carroll have also figured it out, and they recognize that in the age of this fourth industrial revolution, the humanities, with an emphasis on communication, creativity, and critical thinking, have much to offer to better understand the use and impact of emerging technologies. Dr. Siva Vanapali and a team with colleagues at the University of Nottingham are working closely with NASA on an experiment to measure the strength of roundworms in space. Now, this is the kind of thing that the press will take and misrepresent, <laughs> right? <laughs> uh, 
Um, but, but this will be the first time researchers will be measuring the effects of space flight on the physical strength of worms and correlating the changes to gene expression alteration in the worm's muscle. Now, why is this important? The study is important because astronauts in space lose a significant amount of their muscle mass, and hence, this is very important to NASA. Catherine Hayhoe, one of the most renowned noted climate scientists in the world, was recently honored by the United Nations as a champion of the Earth. And finally, uh, Dominic Casadante was awarded one of the 2017 Presidential Awards for Excellence in Science, Mathematics, and Engineering Mentoring. Only three individuals in Texas received this honor. Now, just recently, I referenced this letter that you received regarding your scholarly and research accomplishments with goals for the coming year. These goals include a focus on all forms of scholarship and creative activity that will strengthen our position in the ranks of the Carnegie Very High Research Activity category and help us move into the top 50 of public research institutions as published by the Center for Majoring University Performance. But I would emphasize that more than inclusion in any list, we need to continue to capitalize on the unique opportunities and resources of West Texas in areas of land, water, and energy as we address regional, national, and worldwide challenges. And at the same time, we have a history of strength in the humanities and a rich culture in the performing and creative arts that provide novel opportunities to impact the quality of life and the prestige of our university. Our third priority in our strategic plan deals with outreach and engagement. And the Office of University Outreach and Engagement was established in 2015 in the office of the provost to provide innovative, collaborative, and strategic leadership to support the university's strategic priority. The engagement involves members of the university and the community working together to address common issues affecting our society, leveraging our academic expertise, but doing this in a mutually beneficial and respectful way. And if you glance at that slide, you'll see the enormous amount of effort and uh, activity that occurs in this area with our faculty and the surrounding community. This priority is led by Dr. John Opperman in the Provost's Office, and you can review a recent publication, you may have gotten it, if not, it's online, that contains some wonderful stories of how faculty scholarship is being bought, brought to bear on a number of challenges in our community and the world. I'd like to make a few comments about budget and facilities. When I talk about money, I need to take a drink. <laughs> Um, for the first time, Texas, Tech, but Texas Tech's budget this fiscal year exceeded $1 billion. And I want to emphasize that our priority has and will always be our people. For the current fiscal year, the increase in revenue that we received, $14.6 million, has been used to address, be, to be invested in our merit and equity pool, the minimum wage increase, retirement contributions and scholarships, and what was left over was distributed to the college as a result of the budget hearing process. I want to commend Noelle Sloan, CFO, for the good work that she and her team does in ensuring that we are operating as efficiently as possible and keeping administrative costs low. Our administrative overhead at Texas Tech is 6%, and that is among the lowest of all institutions in the state. This past fall, we had ribbon cuttings for two magnificent facilities, the Experimental Sciences Building II and the Majin Theater. We are also in the fourth year of a $20 million commitment to refurbishing classrooms and laboratories known as Raider Rooms. Uh, we're, you may have heard and you will hear more about plans for the centennial celebration. We will be celebrating our 100th birthday in 2023. 
I have appointed a committee, and they have begun work on planning for the celebrations, beginning with the Carol of Lights in 2022 and ending with the Carol of Lights in 2023. Dr. Elisa Wong uh, is co-chairing that effort with Grace Hernandez, but Elisa and Sean Cunningham, Chair of History, are working on a book, 100 Years, 100 Voices, which, rather than being a chronological history of tech, will provide stories of people who helped to make Texas Tech what it is today. Most of it good, but some things controversial and not always uh, as good as others. We, um, so this will be an opportunity to, there'll be an opportunity to extend this effort to the broader public uh, by submitting names to people who might be, uh, should be noted as among those voices through the web. But you'll hear much more about this in the future. So in conclusion, I would like to state that we are making progress in gaining status as one of the top educations in higher education, a place that is special because of dedicated faculty and staff, faculty and staff that help to prepare our students to succeed professionally and personally. We had a retreat uh, late this summer attended by our Board of Regents and Chancellor Mitchell and the presidents of each component. And I, I want to convey that we enjoy tremendous support from our board and the leadership of Chairman Huckabee and the leadership of Chancellor Mitchell. Towards the end of that experience, a comment was made that in the light of so many recent accomplishments and successes, one person said, this is our finest hour. And um, it's not. <laughs> There's so much more to do. Yes, things are good, but we all know much remains to be done. And because of you, our staff, students, faculty, and on our friends, I look forward to what we can accomplish in the in next, this coming year and years to come. And with that, I'd be glad to take any questions. I think there's a microphone. Yes. Where's the microphone? Here. Well, thank you very much. <laughs> Excuse me? Yeah. Well, you don't feel comfortable. You don't have to. <laughs> okay. Well, uh, if not, going once, twice, three times. There's refreshments out there, and I look forward to seeing you out there. Thank you very much for being here.